When we think of astrophotography, we might imagine a dark summer night sky filled with stars, or perhaps here in the Arecibo Observatory. For the typical institutional astronomical observatory, that would be correct. But for the majority of amateur astronomers, truly dark skies are getting harder to find without having to drive a great distance. And the more time behind the wheel, the less time at the telescope. For astrophotography, however, a telescope in the 4 to 6 inch size can record remarkably faint objects because you can gather and store the light to create an image through a series of time exposures, called subs, that are stacked to create a final image. You can even photograph an object that you can't even see visually in the telescope. In addition, the stellar resolution of a good refractor in this size range, around one arc second, matches up very well with the resolution allowed by atmospheric seeing, especially on long exposure dark sky images. What about city lights? You still need dark skies for astrophotography, don't you? Well, yes and no. If you plan on using any of the digital one-shot color or DSLR cameras, then it would be better to have dark skies. But if you are prepared to spend the time learning how to create a color image using narrow band imaging filters and a monochrome CCD camera, then let the light shine. The camera can't see them. So, let's start out with the fundamental components that make up an astrophotography platform. The mount is the foundation of the imaging platform and often an overlooked crucial component. If the mount is not up to the task of precision guiding for long exposure photography, then no matter the quality of the telescope, the resulting images will be disappointing. The rule of thumb is to put financial resources into the mount and if necessary, upgrade the telescope later on. Pictured here is a TMB92SS triplet with a 3 inch feather touch focuser. The objective is made of an airspace three lens element designed by Thomas Back in order to bring the full spectrum of incoming light into alignment after passing through the lens cell. Here are three illustrations depicting the different wavelengths and how they focus at different points with the three basic lens cells available for refracting telescopes. In a triplet, red, green, and blue light is brought to a single focus. In astrophotography, this single focus is desirable as a CCD lens is more sensitive than the human eye. Many astrophotographers have good results using a reflecting telescope that doesn't suffer from chromatic aberration. That smaller scope on top of the imaging scope, that's the guide scope. Until recently, astrophotography required manual guiding for long exposure deep sky imaging. Most mounts do not possess gears good enough to allow that. This made the use of a guide scope necessary, then and now. Except back then, the guide scope needed to be twice the focal length of the imaging scope. This was necessary so that you could precisely keep a guide star centered in the crosshairs of a guide scope's high-powered eyepiece for the duration of the exposure. But to the delight of astrophotographers, the introduction of CCD and CMOS auto guide cameras and their software have made manual guiding a thing of the past. And the guiding quality delivered by an auto guider cam is far superior to what you could do by eye. And better yet, the guide scope no longer needs to be twice the focal length of the imaging scope due to the sensitivity of the CCD camera. So, is it really that simple? Well, as always, the devil's in the details. Learning to auto guide does have its challenges, which consist of assembling workable equipment and setting up the software that does the work. 
But before we can all go back in the house and finish watching reruns of Star Trek while we wait for our subs to come in, we must choose a camera and a guide scope, choose an auto guiding program, a method of mounting the guide scope and camera, and, hardest of all, get everything working together. Does this sound like a lot of work? Well, it's not all that bad once you get the hang of it, and adds just a few more minutes to your imaging routine. Let's move on to the imaging camera. There are many options to consider when choosing a CCD camera, but the basic difference between models is the chip itself and whether it is provided with thermoelectric cooling which produces cleaner images. And like telescopes, there are other features available which may make a certain camera more desirable. A bigger chip will, all other things being equal, image a bigger part of the sky. However, cost has a funny way of making some things more equal than others and a short focal length telescope with a smaller imaging chip may have a wider field of view than a long focal length telescope with a larger chip. Depending on what you want to image, a small format CCD may suffice, but it is usually desirable to have a chip as large as your budget and practicality will allow. Another feature of a CCD camera is the pixel size. Pixel is short for picture element and describes the tiny squares which make up a CCD image. Pixels can refer either to the individual squares in an image or the actual light sensitive squares on the CCD chip, also known as photocytes. On a given telescope, smaller pixels give higher resolution, but larger pixels tend to be more sensitive. There's always a trade-off. But for most purposes, figure the number of pixels and the size of the chip itself are more important than pixel size. It should be noted that a CCD camera with thermoelectric cooling will have significantly less hot pixels than one without cooling. Hot pixels are created from heat generated within the chip during long exposure photography. But I have gotten surprisingly good results using an uncooled Astro CCD camera during very cold winter nights. A monochrome camera, necessary for narrowband imaging, also has the advantage of having four times the resolution of a one-shot color camera using the same chip, because a color chip ties up four photocytes to represent one pixel, whereas a monochrome CCD uses one photocyte to represent one pixel. In an ideal world, every CCD imager would have the biggest, most expensive CCD camera available just like every amateur astronomer would have the biggest telescope. But like telescopes, price is always a factor, and almost any quality CCD camera will work fine with any capable telescope. Technique really is a big part of it, and great images have been taken with small telescopes and relatively inexpensive CCD cameras from suburban backyards many of which are even better than some of the images taken with high-end sophisticated telescopes, monster CCDs, and permanent observatories at dark sites. And now for the star of the show, narrow band filters. In normal color imaging, three filters, red, green, and blue, are used to separate the primary colors of the visual spectrum. These filters are designed to approximate the color sensitivity of the human eye so that the resulting image is true color. Each of the RGB filters covers approximately one-third of the visual spectrum and the filters overlap slightly so that the whole spectrum is detected by the CCD. Narrow band filters, which have only recently been available to amateur astronomers, instead capture a very small part of the spectrum. They are said to have a narrow band pass. The band pass is simply how much of the spectrum the filter allows to pass. This is usually measured in nanometers, 
This smaller portion of the light spectrum is useful for isolating certain features of an object. For example, emission nebulas give off much of their light at a wavelength of 656.3 nanometers. This wavelength corresponds to light given off by excited hydrogen atoms, which are the primary constitute of emission nebulas. Instead of passing a 100 nanometer wide section of the spectrum, a narrowband filter might have a band pass of only several nanometers. By allowing only the light emitted by nebula to pass, light from artificial sources like street lights is blocked. And so, if you are one of the many aspiring astrophotographers with limited access to truly dark skies, then narrowband filters can provide a solution to that challenge. Another advantage of narrowband imaging is the ability to detect more detail. Narrowband images isolate the light given off by specific kinds of gas, so the images have scientific value and that it can tell a lot about what's going on inside the nebula. There are mainly three types of narrowband filters used in astrophotography, which are also used by the Hubble Space Telescope. The most dominant emission line in a star-forming region, such as the Orion Nebula, is called hydrogen alpha, or H-alpha. This light is created by atomic hydrogen, the primary constitute of the universe, and the basis of the nuclear fusion that powers stars. If you're just starting out, try imaging through a hydrogen alpha filter only. The Hoff filter can bring out remarkable enhancements with objects containing dominant emission in the hydrogen alpha line. These objects are mostly red emission nebula, but can also be complex nebula with a dominant hydrogen emission component. Many astrophotographers are quite content with monochrome displays of these images. Next is the oxygen-3 line, which is given off by doubly iodized oxygen atoms, meaning the electrons are dropping two energy levels. This line is the blue-green portion of the spectrum. It corresponds, by happy coincidence, to the peak sensitivity of the dark-adapted human eye. So O3 filters are common visual accessories. The O3 line is the dominant emissions from planetary nebula. And finally, Sulfur-2. Singularly iodized sulfur emits light in the deep red part of the spectrum, beyond hydrogen alpha. It is a weaker emission than hydrogen alpha and O3, but it is the most common filter used after these two. As you can see, narrowband filters do not attempt to replicate the spectral sensitivity of the human eye. In most cases, they reveal things our eyes can't see. Typically, three filters are used and each is assigned to one channel of the RGB image.